Terry, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Yes, I'm so excited to have you on. We're going to dive uh, deep into um, a couple of your papers and primarily cover your concept of three nested uh, dynamically hierarchic, hierarchic levels of systems, uh, which are also at the heart of your legendary book, Incomplete Nature. Um, and it's, yeah, about, uh, I think about a hundred pages, uh, a third of the way, two thirds of the way in, um, you cover these three hierarchic levels. So we're going to dive deep into that concept. But um, before we get super technical, can you give the audience a sense of your many and varied domains of research? So I, I began my work um, in biological anthropology, biology and anthropology, and focused on the neuroscience of, of brain evolution and this particular case of human language. Uh, and throughout the, the 80s, um, my work was comparative neuroanatomy, uh, in which I was trying to answer a very simple question, or should have been a simple question, it turns out not to be, of course, um, <laughs> which is, um, given the fact that we're the only species that, that naturally and quickly and easily uh, communicates linguistically, um, one ought to be able to see the features of the human brain that distinguish it from the brains of, of non-human primates uh, that correlate with this distinction. And so looking at this, one of the first things I did was to identify uh, some of the major connections in other species brains, in monkey brains primarily, uh, and notice that in comparing a number of other systems, uh, it looks as though the connectivity we just the time had just been developing measures for analyzing axonal connectivity, that is neuron to neuron, um, but the connectivity patterns looked very, very similar to what we would have predicted for language. And it was a real yes. surprise for me. Um, and subsequently, I, I think we are now pretty convinced that the, the way the circuitry works in brains is, is very conservative across mammals. Uh, brains have been, are very, very similar in the way they get put together and so on. Um, mm. And that some of the big differences in human brains have to do with relative proportions. Uh, but because of the work in developmental neuroscience, it became clearer and clearer during the 1980s um, that, that the development of brains was a com comparative process that looked a lot like an evolution process in microcosm in which hmm. connections compete with each other. And so the actual wiring of the adult brain is the result of this competitive process. As a result, um, I became much more interested in, in how the brain became effectively ger gerrymandered um, uh, in human evolution, in which the si relative sizes of parts actually contributed to this comp comp competition between axons for finding their targets. And hmm. the fact that human brains were unusually large uh, for our bodies became an important piece of my analysis. Uh, and I began to shift my thinking in a way that was basically what today we would call evo devo. That is, how it is that developmental processes have contributed to the structure of brains. Um, now, all of this was driven in part because of my interest in another field called semiotics, the study of communication in the broadest sense, the study of representation. And for the most part, um, or I thought that this would become a major part of science, uh, people have still not caught on. Uh, and we basically think about language as sort of the, the generic form of communication, even though it's probably the most weird form of communication mm. to ever have evolved in only one species <laughs> and only in the last maybe million and a half years at most. Mm. Um, right. And yet we still think about it as sort of the, the, the car caricature of a typical communication system. But of course, it's radically different. And mm. um, so I began to analyze these differences and try to understand how the semiotic difference of language, what makes language as symbolic as, as opposed to indexical or, or iconic, as they call it, um, uh, and try to understand that in terms of the structure and the changing in circuitry of the brain. Mm. Um, and as I said, a lot of my work was comparative neuroanatomy, but a lot of it mm. was also trying to sort of bring these two ideas together. Um, mm -hmm. In the 1990s, I spent my career studying how these connections develop um, during early development. And we did this using cross-species neural transplantation, in which we, mm -hmm. took, we took cells from um, one species. Typically, we used uh, pigs 
pig brains from a very early embryonic stage and implanted them into rat brains or monkey brains. In particular, we were looking at this as a potential technique for repairing Parkinsonism and Huntington's disease, in which certain yeah. classes of neurons die out in the process. Yeah. And if we could replace them, in effect, it would be a useful therapeutic technology. Um, we did find it worked well, if, for example, in rats, didn't work well in monkeys, and we had no mm -hmm. success when it was finally taken to human patients. We had very brief success, but the immune system uh, always beat us and wiped out the, the sure. rats. Uh, so it was given up as a technology. Uh, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, my approach to this and my reason for doing this work was to understand what are the mechanisms by which these connections actually find their targets. And you've got to remember that what's going on in the brain is cells in one part of the brain are growing their output branch, their axon, and it sniffs its way through the brain to find a particular target. And as mm. this happens, they're in competition with each other, and uh, some get eliminated, some get enhanced in that process. And so um, it was really a, an exciting way, using one species neurons, in which we actually had markers. We could look at those individual axons growing and finding their targets. And it turns out that that um. that pig neurons repaired rat brains just fine. And in fact, temporarily repaired um, monkey brains and even human patient brains briefly uh, in this wow. process. But, but in fact, the immune system could not be conquered. And so it was never developed. But the fact is that we're even, even able to show that, that these connections actually established across species, appropriate synapses developed, and these neurons would find their targets their appropriate targets in a totally different species brain growing in a totally different pattern and yet yeah. would reconstruct uh, functional circuits and actually produce repair of function. Uh, that was a really exciting finding. And it was, of course, contributing to my thinking about how language in the brain develops. But um, mm. I then became much more interested in more basic questions. Um, and a lot of it had to do with, well, why does biology work this way at all? You know, what are these mechanisms in this process? And so uh, when I moved to California, moved to, to Berkeley in, in just the, the 2000s, early 2000s, I shifted my attention to ask some of these more basic questions. And questions in part about, um, you know, what's the nature of neurological information? Um, how is it that evolution can do what it does? And to what extent do we fully understand the process? Um, do we need a sort of more basic physics approach to it? Uh, and so this led to my book, Incomplete Nature, in the 2011-12 uh, that came mm -hmm. out. And my work there was actually a sort of a prequel to, this, to a book I produced uh, back in uh, 95 called The Symbolic Species, really sort mm -hmm. of tracing this question about how human brains have developed. Um, but the prequel was very simple. I needed to know um, what are the deep down mechanisms? What does it even make sense to say that living processes are processing information, that neurological activity is about something in the world, uh, and that, that organisms, even bacteria, sort of have this sort of aboutness problem. They want to know what, what their world is like. They need to find food, need to avoid danger. Um, this is sort of built into this very basic chemical process. And what drove my interest in this, besides just sort of getting underneath some of these basic processes, was this question, um, well, at the origins of life, there was this fundamental shift in thermodynamics. Even the simplest life, in a sense, inverts at least locally some obvious and ubiquitous thermodynamic principles. The second law of thermodynamics, that things tend to sort of break down. Uh, get more mixed up over time spontaneously. Well, it, it turns out that, that here's the interesting thing about that question, and that is that this had to happen spontaneously. The transition to early, the earliest forms of life had to be spontaneous. It had to be incredibly simple because there was no guiding principles driving it. It had to be very simple, and it had to involve only a few chemical processes. How could such a radical change in physics occur in such a simple system spontaneously. And so that, in a sense, question like, you know, like, like the, the sand grain that forms a pearl in an oyster, right. um, 
Mm-hmm. It drove me to think this process through. And as a result, um, a book that I thought I was going to write on the brain and, and you know, some underlying principles about brain development turned out to be a much more um, deep dive into some deep thermodynamic and information questions. Mm. And so the, the phrase incomplete nature um, is actually my suspicion that um, there's something fundamental about life that has to do with it, the way it's incomplete, why life needs the world. It needs to take in in energy and food at all all times. It needs to keep running to stay in one place, so to speak. Um, And it's fundamentally incomplete. And I realized that that same logic had to apply to the nervous system. And that the very, very nature of uh, informational representation and significance has to do with something being about something that's not present. How could Mm. the chemistry and physics of a body or the brain be about things that aren't present? What does it mean to be about something? A a deep philosophical question. Um, Mm. And what I realized is that, to some extent, the incompleteness was a fundamental feature of life. Uh, And it's led me subsequently to think that the so-called Gödel's incompleteness proof is a way to think about even the cosmos itself. That is, the Gödel showed mathematically and formally that, that you can't have a system that is both complete and coherent or consistent with itself. Um, mm-hmm. and so the issue is if you want a system that's, co- that's consistent, where there's no magic, where there's no miracles, it can't be complete. And I've begun to think that you know, the cosmos and life and mind all reflect this very principle, hence the yeah. title Incomplete Nature. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Wow, that was a wonderful uh, trajectory from your early career uh, to this, this this masterpiece of a book and, and to your work that you're doing now, too. So I'd love to, um, since we could, we could talk about so many different topics, we could jump around between, but I'd love to focus the conversation on um, this main paper that I'll link below in the description for, uh, for folks listening and watching this. Um, the paper is called Teleodynamics, Specifying the Dynamical Principles of Intrinsically and Directed Processes. And it's a very short paper. It's only four pages, but it's very dense, and there's a lot to go, uh, go, into, go into for it um, and on it. So I really want to unpack these, these three levels of systems. Uh, so we have homeodynamics, morphodynamics, and teleodynamics. And of course, th- this is a big part of, the, of your book as well, in Complete Nature. Um, so can you provide us with, before we dive into each of the levels, uh, a brief overview of these three dynamics? So they're my renaming of, of things and to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to rename them in part so that people would understand it distinctively, so that we wouldn't get mm. stuck in sort of the old baggage. Uh, so sure. homeodynamics is referring to any dynamical process that sort of um, equilibrates things. Homeo meaning, you know, in a sense, homogenized. Um, mm. And the second law of thermodynamics is about how processes spontaneously become more and more homogenized over time, um, unless they're perturbed or prevented from doing that. Um, and most inorganic chemistry and physics is, is homeodynamic in a sense. And it's mm. it's a a more general way to talk about this thermodynamic principle, but I, I want to apply it, of course, beyond just chemistry and physics to biological processes, to neurological processes, maybe even, though not in the book in this case, to social processes, the communication processes. Mm. What kind mm-hmm. of processes do we engage in that spontaneously, dynamically homogenize? Um, that's what thermodynamics has been about for most of the last couple of centuries, um, last century and a half. Um, sure. In, in the late two thousand, in the late nineteen hundreds, uh, that is, beginning about nineteen eighty and, and nineteen seventy, nineteen sixty, um, we began to focus on far from equilibrium systems. And one of the things that, that came out, and these, although discoveries were made about this back even at the beginning of the twentieth century, um, uh, there are processes that locally seem to move in the opposite direction, that become not less organized not more homo- homogeneous, but in fact, um, move in the opposite direction. And they've recently taken on the, the term self-organization. Um, I think the, the problem with those, that phrase is there's no self involved. Um, right. a, a typical simple example is a whirlpool in your bathtub. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, you pull the plug and the water is going down and it forms a whirlpool. Um, what's happened is what was initially chaotic water movements going down this, this, this hole uh, effectively begin to organize themselves. Um, back in the 1950s, a researcher who sort of first dealt with these questions actually called it self-simplification. Because what's actually mm -hmm. happening is that um, the trajectories of molecules were all over the map, so to speak, and then they organized themselves. Now, th there's no self. There's no nobody had to stir it. Um, it just sort of spontaneously happens as molecules that are sort of getting in each other's way because they're sort of bumping into each other and slowing themselves down um, get replaced by trajectories that are more circularly consistent. And so in the formation of a whirlpool, what happens is the you might say the the trajectory that a single molecule will follow is now much simplified. It's shortened. So it's a it's a quicker path to empty it. That means if you were um in a sense stirring and messing up the whirlpool so it didn't form, uh your tub would empty slower. It actually is a maximizing the 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 flow. Uh, there's been a bunch of thermodynamic efforts to describe this process. Sometimes it's called maximum entropy production principle. Um, right. And I want to distinguish this from the maximum entropy. Maximum entropy is as mixed up as you can get. Things can get totally mixed up, and you just can't mix them up any further. That is, you, you start stirring your coffee, and the, mm -hmm. and the the sugar is dissolving. But at a certain point, no matter how much you stir, you're not going to mix it up anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what it's reached maximum entropy at that stage. Entropy is one of these terms that is very confusing and very hard for people to understand. We sometimes confuse it with the idea of disorder. Entropy is not disorder. Ent entropy is a measure of something. It's a measure mm -hmm. of, I would say, how mixed up something is. I think that's the simplest mm -hmm. way to say it. Um, but it turns gotcha. out that, that whirlpools and lots of other structures, I became very interested even as an undergraduate back in the 1970s uh, in in how uh, snow crystals become so organized and how they can be some, become so uniquely organized with each other in which mm. all of the six branches, in a sense, reflect each other's symmetries in a remarkable mm. way. It just seemed to me for a spontaneous thermodynamic process, the stuff falling through the sky, um, how could it possibly become so organized? It's a self-organizing process. And it has to do with mm. um, processes in which they're always being perturbed away from equilibrium. And so there's this sort of constant inflow and outflow that's going on. Of course, that's what's going on with the with the simple whirlpool. Uh, and there are lots of other examples of this. I won't go into them. But um, I described all of this as not just self organization for the reasons I mentioned. I didn't like the term self, and there's no organ. There's nothing that's doing the organizing. It is in a sense falling into simplicity uh, in some respects. The movements mm. of molecules are becoming more simple, uh, but they produce more form. They're more constrained. Uh, they don't have so many degrees of freedom of movement. And they form forms. Um, and so the, the whirlpool, of course, is a circular form. So I dub this morphodynamics. What are the dynamics? How do you describe the dynamics of processes that fall into regular forms? Even though um, there's nothing forcing them into those forms, and even though they're being constantly perturbed away from equilibrium. Um, and then it turns out that throughout the 80s and 90s and now over the last couple of decades, um, the idea of self-organization has sort of really caught on as a hot topic, particularly talking mm. about life, that life is self-organized. Why? Because, well, of course, life does exactly what we're talking about. It produces regular form um, in a way that looks spontaneous. Uh, but here's there's, there's a deep problem in this. And that is self-organizing processes, morphodynamic processes, are actually self-destructive. Uh, for the very simple reason that the bathtub empties faster if it gets organized. Um, that lots of self-organizing processes, um, they undermine the very gradient of energy or matter flow faster than if it wasn't there. So in effect, they're organized to destroy themselves as fast as possible. That's the maximum entropy production. So it's, it's producing this, this process faster. The more you heat it, the faster it gets rid of the heat. So for example, um, so 
uh, what I realized is that we can't stop there to describe life. Life is not in the process of undermining and destroying itself. It's doing everything it can to sort of keep itself going. Uh, now, it doesn't do it forever. Um, there are both evolutionary and thermodynamic reasons why that's the case. But, um, but I realized there must be a step beyond this. We often call this process of generating regular forms. Sometimes it's been used to describe emergent processes, forms that seem to show up spontaneously that nobody had to create. And so the right. term emergence has been there. And so people have sort of, I think, confused the emergence of regularity in self-organizing more from the dynamic processes um, with yeah. the origins of life and even with thought processes. And we'll see that there turns out to be various theories of brain function that use this logic. But as I was pointing out a second ago, that in fact, um, these are self-undermining processes. So it, the reason I wrote Incomplete Nature is I became convinced that there had to be a way to, in a sense, stabilize these unstable processes. How is it that a process that is thermodynamically driving itself away from equilibrium, producing transient forms that are undermining the very energy source it's driven by, how could these kinds of processes stabilize themselves? And in fact, if we think about life on Earth, stabilizing a process like this for three, three and a half billion years at least, um, this is a remarkable, in a sense, uh, defeating the second law of thermodynamics, but also defeating morphodynamics, defeating this ability for a system to sort of organize itself. Um, so I then tried to conceive of what's, since using going back to my question, what's a really simple system that could both reverse the second law of thermodynamics and maintain itself even though it was utilizing these processes, these morphodynamic processes, because living systems have to generate form. So they have to generate their regularity and their form uh, by virtue mm -hmm. of one of these processes that's far from equilibrium, but they can't let them destroy the system. How does it work? So my insight came from thinking about not simple life, but viruses. Viruses precisely because viruses are sort of this interesting boundary case in which some biologists will say, no, they're not really alive uh, because they don't metabolize. They don't do anything to protect themselves. Uh, they don't look for food. Uh, they just get stuck on, on other cells. They embed themselves in those cells and then commandeer all the chemistry of those cells to reproduce themselves. So I would say Currently, there's still an open question as to whether we want to call viruses alive. They're just these inert chunks of molecules, clusters of molecules that can get inside of cells and reproduce themselves. The problem, of course, is that as we've learned to our disadvantage, um, viruses evolve. Viruses become better at adapting to us and to mm -hmm. reproducing themselves at our expense. Um, things that evolve aren't inert chunks of chemistry. They have a kind of indirectedness. They are, in a sense, protecting themselves. They're adapting sure. with respect to the world. So these, um, these chunks of molecules, these clusters of molecules, um, to some extent, are the boundary between life and non-life. And so I use that as a kind of hint as to how, to how to think about this problem. And two factors came to mind. And this has to do with going back to the concept of morphodynamics, self-organizing processes, um, mm -hmm. with respect to molecular processes. One of these has to do with what we call self-assembly. It turns out lots of aspects of the body, uh, including the walls of cells, microtubules within cells, um, but lots of other regular features of bodies, self-assemble. And self-assembly is basically, it's a kind of morphodynamic process. It's in fact, a crystallization process. Think of snow crystals again. Mm -hmm. Snow crystals self-assemble. Um, and they self-assemble by virtue of being pushed off equilibrium, of having um, energy and material passing through them, and dumping this, this e disequilibrium as fast as possible, and therefore producing these regular forms. It turns out that, that viruses are contained in shells called capsids, that are made of 
typically of proteins, that because of their shape fall into crystalline-like lattices. That is, they have a regular geometric shape that gets them stuck together. Um, and they form polyhedrons, containers. So this sheet folds in on itself as a container. Well, it turns out that that's, that's a morphodynamic process. But there's a second morphodynamic process that I paid attention to that's also characteristic of all kinds of living processes. And that has to do with catalysis. Um, a man named Stuart Kaufman, um, some decades ago now, began studying what he called collectively autocatalytic nets of molecules. And the idea is that a catalyst doesn't get destroyed in its aiding the production of a certain chemical reaction. A chemical reaction that might occur because it's energetically more likely, but there's a, a big threshold for it to get started. And what happens is that a catalyst simply decreases that threshold and allows the chemical reaction to take place. But if catalyst A produces a molecule, then it's a catalyst to produce another molecule, which produces catalyst A, then we have a, a circle of cat catalysts, um, an autocatalytic set. Autocatalytic mm -hmm. meaning that the catalysts produce more catalysts that produce more catalysts in a circle. Sure, yeah, what, runaway effect. What yeah. I realized is that that's also a process that's characteristic of almost all living systems. But here's what's interesting about that. And that is, if a system like that produced more and more catalysts, what would normally happen in a solution anywhere is that the catalysts would eventually diffuse away from each other. But if they depend on each other, they need to stay in the same place. So diffusion, the second law of thermodynamics, is a problem for autocatalysis. For the self-assembly of a virus shell, there's a similar problem. And that is, as the shell grows and uh, new molecules accrete to the shell, um, it decreases the concentration in the surrounding fluids. And as a result, it eventually slows and stops. So what has to happen inside of a cell when a virus attacks it the, the DNA or RNA of the virus has to produce lots of these proteins and lots of copies of the DNA and RNA. And the shells self-assemble and they enclose some of the DNA or RNA spontaneously. They just, you produce a lot of each. Uh, and as a result, um, you have two morphodynamic processes. But what I realized is that you can replace the RNA and DNA with autocatalysis, with the catalytic circle. And if that catalytic circle had a side product that was also capable of self-assembly, then an enclosure, a capsid, would form where the most rapid catalysis was taking place and therefore would enclose those catalysts. At some point, the whole process would stop once it gets enclosed. Why? Because the catalysts use up all the raw materials. But if the system gets broken open somehow by heat or whatever other process, uh, in an environment where there's other precursor molecules to the catalysts, um, then the whole process would start again and it would even close itself. That what's happening in this case is that each of these two morphodynamic processes, self-assembly and reciprocal catalysis, are in a sense duals of each other. They produce the boundary conditions that the other needs. So the self-assembly needs more and more of these molecules, these capsid molecules, to be produced as they're being taken up into the, into the complex. And the catalysts need something that keeps them from diffusing away from each other so they can interact and continue the process. Mm -hmm. The system will eventually, as a result, close and close the catalysts that produce the very process. So we now had a system based on two very simple molecular processes that occur all throughout the universe. That is not alive. It doesn't metabolize itself. It only repairs itself if damaged. But if it's really seriously damaged and parts get strewn all over the place, it can also reproduce itself. Two of them can form instead of one. And that that reproductive-like process is basically just a repair process sort of gone to the extreme. We now have a system that is, in a sense, capable of evolution in a very minimal sense, mm -hmm. capable of protecting each of these processes from running to their end and stopping 
and holding the whole system together. It's got a kind of constraint in which now you have, in the simplest possible system, um, a, a mechanism, a molecular mechanism that has itself as its own end. That is, it's organized so that if d disturbed, it produces itself again. It repairs the damage. So, yeah. so I've used that as a kind of a model to begin thinking about a bunch of things. Mm. One of them is um, the origins of indirected processes, teleology. Um, this yeah. is a chemical process that repairs itself. Um, the other one is information, because if it can repair itself, but also duplicate itself, then it's passing on information about its own structure. So in a very simple model system, we've actually tried to simulate it in various ways. I've tried to convince people who do viral research to produce these. Uh, that's not happened yet. But as a simple way of thinking about a problem, it turns out to have been a very, very productive, you might say, thought experiment. I think it will eventually turn out to be a, an actual physical feature that we find in the world. Sure. My own suspicion is we're going to find a lot more of these structures, which I call auto-generative auto auto systems or mm -hmm. autogens um, auto for guns, short. Yeah. I think we're going to find these all over the universe because they're simple. Mm -hmm. They're not life. Right. But they transition away from self-organization, away from morphodynamics, away from homeodynamics, to something that does something different than both of those. Yeah. It uses, you might say, the increase of entropy, the law, the second law of thermodynamics, against itself to maintain itself. Um, sure. That's something that life does in the simplest. So, so this is a theory about, you might say, proto-life. Um, but given the fact that it's so simple and that I think autocatalysis and self-assembly are so ubiquitous, I think there could be uh, hundreds of thousands of variants of this in the universe. Right. Um, in various That's, places yeah. where we wouldn't expect to find life. Sure. Including, I think, uh, in deep petroleum deposits on Earth. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'd love to... Um, That's fascinating. You gave us a good um, sort of overview in, in terms of where, where this could go potentially um, and all the way through from, from homeo to morpho to telio. I'd love to bring us back just a little bit because especially for, for listeners who aren't as familiar with these topics or uh, don't have the grounding. Um, so we, homeodynamics, we can think basically as very similar to thermo, thermodynamics or at least it encompasses thermodynamics plus a little extra, right? Is that a, a decent way to, Explain it. Well, it. Basically, any process that dynamically gets more and more mixed up over time. Gotcha. It tends towards equilibrium, let's say. And yeah. so, yeah, it's great. So that's, yeah, it's the most basic. That's the grounding, right? And then we have the next level, which is morphodynamics. And for this one, and you touched on, you know, a lot of this, I think it helps folks to, uh, to understand that morphodynamics occurs when you have two homeodynamic systems that are let's say coupled, and there's a complementation that happens there. But I think what's really interesting is, as you, you, you talked about it just a little bit, the constraints that are generated, that are started. Right. Now, how, when are the conditions just right for morph morphogenesis to take place? So the morphodynamic process is very uncommon. We don't find things spontaneously right. forming regularity very often. So mm. it's, it's a special case of homeodynamics. Um, but typically what happens in, in any of these processes, we get two homeodynamic processes interacting with each other in opposite ways. So think of the formation of snow crystals. So what's happening sure. is the snow crystal is being um, changed by virtue of picking up water molecules, and they attach to it. Um, but as each water molecule attaches to the growing snow crystal, it gives off a little bit of heat into the crystal that has to be dispersed out. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that as each new molecule, each, each new water molecule attaches, um, it, in a sense, perturbs the snow crystal, makes it warmer. And that's a thermodynamic process in which it's adding heat to the system. And the snow crystal is 
removing that heat as possible, but not actively removing, but the heat dissipates away as fast as possible. And basically what's going on is it takes the shortest possible route to get out, so to speak. But the shortest possible route turns out to be quite regular. And so snow crystals grow and become more and more regular because there's a homeodynamic input and a homeodynamic output that come to roughly balance each other. There's another really famous example that people have been studying for years and years called uh, Raleigh-Bernard convection. Um, mm -hmm. This happens when you have a, a thin layer of oil in a heated pan. Um, there's many things online where you can sort of watch this happening if people are interested. Uh, and what happens if you heat it fairly evenly from the bottom? Initially, simply the random motion of the oil molecules um, will take the heat from the bottom of the pan and dissipate it out into the atmosphere. So it goes through this, this thin layer of oil. But at some level of heat, the heat is coming in faster than that this passive process, this sort of random process can eliminate the heat. And so what happens is that the gradient of heat begins to do work that causes some molecules to move faster in a more direct pattern towards the surface. Over time, that process, as it, in a sense, moves to the point at which the input of heat and the output of heat become balanced rate, the only way to do that is to move oil molecules up directly to give off heat and then to fall directly to pick up heat again. And what you get is these what we call convection cells uh, in which um, the surface becomes hexagonal. It becomes organized like, like a surface of a, of a beehive's uh, hexagonal cells. Why? Because hexagons are the closest packing on any even surface. The, the closest packing is there's no other shape that can be packed together so tightly as to be perfectly sort of symmetric in its way of giving off heat. And of course, this is a system that has to give off heat in a completely symmetric way in order to balance this, this displacement away from equilibrium. So as a result, you heat up the system and it becomes morphodynamic. Morphodynamic, meaning that it becomes more and more regular. What's happened, however, is that the random movement of molecules that would have given off heat in a sort of normal, what we call conduction process, the heat that's con conducted out of a just sort of slowly warmed liquid, now becomes a convection in which molecules are moving in a direction. Um, and what's, what's happening is that if you think about each oil molecule as it rises from the bottom where it's hot, and moving a lot towards the top where it gives off heat and slows down and then falls down again because of gravity. Um, that this is a process in which as the system heats up, the constraints on movement become more and more precise. Now molecules are only moving directly up or directly down, taking the shortest path, becoming more constrained. This is why, as this guy mentioned earlier, W. Ross Ashby called this self-simplification, because what's happening is that this is the generation of constraint, generation of order, whereas homeodynamic systems are getting rid of constraints. Constraints meaning that one part is hot, one part is cold, just let it go to equilibrium, and that constraint, that difference in the temperature across the system is evened out. So this is a situation in which constraints are being generated, but they're being generated to some extent because they're getting rid of the asymmetry as fast as possible, getting rid of the disequilibrium as fast as possible. Um, in living systems, we have the opposite problem. We, we've got to use these kinds of processes to generate regularities, to generate constraints, to keep things from interacting in certain ways and allow them to interact in others. Um, but we can't let those constraints destroy themselves. So the question is, how does a system produce constraints and not allow them to disappear? And in fact, make it possible that when there's disturbance that would have disappeared them, in effect, they reconstruct themselves, reconstitute themselves, either in repairing something or in reproducing something. Life is about reproducing constraints. 
Now, it turns out that constraint is a way to think about information also. Information is about constrained relationships. Some things that are connected to other things aren't. Um, and what we talk about when we talk about passing on information from one virus to, a, uh, to another virus in reproduction, we're talking about passing on constraints, limitations on what chemistry can take place and can't take place. I'm, One way I'm to so think about life is, oh, is also that, that in a sense, yeah. we're preventing certain chemistries, chem chemical processes from, from happening. Uh, in fact, when we die, we're freeing up the system. Constraints are going away. And now chemical reactions that wouldn't have taken place during life are now allowed. So mm. to some extent, life is a prevention process. Right. I'm so glad you brought up information because that's one of the main topics, one of the main things yep. I want to ask about, perhaps get some clarity around, is um, is there a mapping at all here between uh, homeomorpho and telio with, say, Shannon information, referential information, and significant information? So is there yes. is there one to one? Is it mixed up? Like how is, if any way, those things are related? It's a good question, in part because we've become confused about the concept historically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Back in 1948, when Claude Shannon um, was able to mathematize communication processes, um, what he did was to successfully get the mathematics right about information, how it gets transferred, how it gets stored, how it gets encrypted or decrypted, and so on. Um, to do so, he had to ignore what refers to, what information is about. The reason for that is quite simple, because about what something is about is not intrinsic. It's not part of the medium. It's something else in the world. And the only way to get to it is to have an interpretive process like you or I, who says, oh, I now see that this is about that. But the, the reference is not intrinsic. So if you want to study intrinsic mathematical statistical properties of a medium, uh, it's useful to ignore that part of it. And in fact, even ignore how it's used, because you can still analyze the flow of electrons or patterns in nature um, without talking about how, what they refer to. And so in 1948, Shannon produced this sort of mathematical theory of communication in which he said, let's now talk about information in terms of surprise. Not talk about what it, what it means, but simply talk about the fact that that when there's a communication channel that could be it could have many different states. If you get all of those states, you don't know anything more than you had from the beginning. But if you know that my favorite example of this is is in the um, Revolutionary War, this classic story about about one if by land, two if by sea. Um, <clears throat> Paul Revere is looking across uh, the Charles River to see how the British are going to travel. And we got his compatriot is going to hang up uh, lights in a bell tower that he'll be able to see this and tell people this is the way the British are coming. Well, it turns out that it could have been one or two. But if you see one, you know one thing. You've constrained the possibilities. A very simple constraint, but enough because there's only two choices here. That it was easy to know one thing so that basically information that carries some news always has to constrain or prevent something else. It has to involve the elimination of some possibilities for other mm -hmm. possibilities. And that's a form of constraint. Shannon went on to show a bunch of interesting things about this. We don't have to go into it. But notice that this at least talks about what must be true of a communication medium for it to carry information. It must be constrained in some way. When we talk about passing on chemical constraints, we're talking the, the same way that Shannon would have talked about this. Hmm. Um, this is information, but it's information in a very minimalist sense. But the difference in the model that I've just described, and this is why it was called telio, end directed dynamics, is that in this case, the information is about something. It's about the very system that can produce these constraints and maintain these constraints, that can produce a physical system that can regenerate those same constraints. That's, of course, another way to think about reproduction in life. 
DNA is containing information about constraints on chemistry that get passed on. Um, I've just described it in the simplest possible way in a sort of what I call autogenic virus, a virus that's not parasitic, but just produces itself. Um, hmm. That's information about something. But notice that there's also a beneficiary, the very system that generates this now benefits in the sense that it doesn't get eliminated, that it can spread. There can be many more copies of itself. Um, information has these three parts. It has constraint, but the constraint can be about something because of the way it's linked to something. In this case, it's linked to the very structure that produces it, the very chemi chemical structure of this complex that I've called an autogenic virus. Um, that linkage is continuous, it's maintained. But that means that that's also the locus of benefit. So this is what we might call significance. What's the value of it? The value of it is that it maintains the ability to generate itself and to reinterpret itself. So that these three levels of information, the structure of a medium, its relation to something else that's not present, its reference, and its significance, that is, its functional contribution to something. And therefore, if it contributes to something, something must benefit and something must be lost. In fact, we always can talk about what, what philosopher, philosophers call normativity. Nor, a norm is, of course, something that can be one way or another, as things can be good or bad, good for something or bad for something, um, right or wrong. Those are norms. Notice that in the chemistry and physics in the inorganic world, there's no good or bad chemistry. There's just chemistry. There's no right or wrong physical interactions. There's just physical interactions. But if the constraints that are passed on succeed in getting passed on and maintaining a system that can produce them, then it's then they are good for or useful for that system. On the other hand, if somehow they get modified, mutated, so that they don't produce a reconstructing, reproducing entity, then it's bad for it. Those changes were bad for it. It's only in life, only where there's a beneficiary, do we have what you might call value. So what we're talking about, not only is it a weird physics that, that happened at the transition to life, but it's also the origins of value, of normativity, of good or bad. I like to, I like to talk about the origins of life as the origins of normative chemistry, where chemistry can now be useful for something or not useful for something. We can find chemistry that's useful for things, but without us, it's just chemistry. Right. Yeah, I'd love to, um, so I do, uh, one thing just for clarity's sake, is there, is it proper to, is it correct to map Shannon information to homeodynamics, referential, to morpho, and uh, significant information to telio? Is that a proper mapping, or do I have that wrong? No, I don't think it is. I, I don't know a relationship where I would say that reference is like self-organization, is like morphodynamics. I don't think so. Sure. I do think there's an interesting hierarchy in both cases that may be related. Right. I think it's yeah. also related to a semiotic hierarchy that also has the mm. same structure. That is, mm. iconic reference, which is referenced by virtue of a signed vehicle of the medium being physically like something else, as having shared properties with what it re re represents. So a drawing, for example. It shares mm -hmm. some formal properties of what it represents. Um, indexical relationships, um, which are about correlations between things. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, um, correlations are relational in a different sense. They're physical relation, so that things can be either happen at the same time or have or or be connected by some physical process. Or we might say that that the fever that somebody has indicates a disease state. Why? Because they're physically connected. One is a part of the other, so to speak. 
uh, and yeah. we use the part to refer to the whole. That's yeah, an that's index. The correlation. With, with homeodynamics, correlation is reduced. How has correlation changed in morpho and teleodynamics? Uh, so in so what, one of the things that's happening in morphodynamics is correlations are being generated. So when uh, we look at okay. a snow crystal, for example, um, each the pattern of each of the branches is correlated in form with the others. So notice that it's both iconic. Each branch is iconic of each other and is correlated with each other. Hmm. So we have the two here. And the third, of course, and this is what drove my early work, is symbolic relationships. In symbolic relationships, the word symbolic is not correlated exactly with anything. The sound symbolic certainly isn't. Um, it is not like symbols. The sound, it's just a sound. Um, what's happened is that language in particular um, is displaced from either iconic or indexical associations with what it refers to. As a result, since words can be anything, so long as we agree to interpret that association in a certain way, um, there's a whole lot more freedom in what it can represent. Whereas if something is representing something else by virtue of being physically correlated with it, um, it doesn't have a lot of freedom to do anything else, to refer to anything else. Similarly with, some, with a representation based upon similarity. Now, it turns out that there are similarities everywhere in the, in the cosmos, and we can take advantage of them. And we can see a, a similarity one place that's the, the, the whirlpool forming in my bathtub and the whirlpool forming at a galaxy. There might be something in common there. Um, we, see, we learn from those similarities. And similarly, we learn from the correlations, the, the causal, the physical correlations. Um, but to actually manipulate them in complicated ways, new connections that are not bound to likeness or correlation. Um, you need to have symbols. The issue is that, as I mentioned before, language, of course, is the most unique biological way to communicate that's ever evolved. It evolved in one species in only one way. That's, that's symbolic communication. Why can't other species do this? Why is this so difficult? And the answer, I think, is very simple. And that is, um, you have to get rid of the iconic and indexical. You have to be willing to just sort of agree to interpret something. The agreement to interpret is iconic. The fact that you and I are both interpreting something in English means that, that we have a sort of interpretive process that's like iconic of each other. If that, but the question is, how do you establish that? How does a whole group of people, without having symbols to do the agreement, to say, let's agree that we're going to call this the same. Let's agree to recall that the same thing. That requires symbols already. So how do you get those agreements? How do you evolve symbolic communication that is distributed in the minds of people in a completely displaced way to the, what it refers to? Um, and that's why it produces a similar sort of hierarchy, why the logic is hierarchically similar. To understand indexicality, you need to already have understood iconicity. My favorite example of this is a windsock. So imagine that you are from a foreign country that's never been in an airport before, and you land in an airport, you look out the window, and you see a windsock blowing in the breeze. What do you see? Do you know at first glance that it's telling you something about the direction and the strength of the wind? The answer is, what does it bring to mind? Now, just imagine, that, uh, again, this thought experiment. Imagine you're there and you've never seen this before. But, of course, you've seen leaves blowing in the wind. You've seen clothes blowing in the wind. You know that when a fabric is extended laterally against the pull of gravity, something must be doing this. And if you can't see anything... Now you have a lot of other experiences because each of the other experiences that come to mind looking at this involve your own experience of wind. So that not only do blowing clothes, blowing hair, blowing leaves um, have some of these iconic features with the windsock, but they also share something else, another icon iconic feature in common. 
they're all associated with the wind. They're all each one is correlated with the wind. And now you can look at the windsock and say, ah, it must be the wind. It indicates the wind. It's a it's an index of the strength and the direction of the wind because of its shape. But to interpret that indexical relationship, you had to already know certain iconic things. You had to already have this other stuff in your mind, or you wouldn't have been able to recognize this. You wouldn't understand its indexical features. And similarly with symbols, it gets even more complex. Because how do you learn what a symbol refers to? Well, people point to things. I'm going to call this a cat. Um, when it's just initially pointed to, you don't know whether it's whether they're referring to being four-legged, furry, mobile, object. But if I point to other things and I point to a, a car and I say, not a cat, and I point to other cats, and I always say cat there, don't say dog. Now, what I can do is that each of these cases is different from the other. But there's an iconism in the sound that was correlated with them. Cat, the sound cat. That iconism of sound correlation makes us ask the question, what's in common between all of these? What if instead of, what if cat actually meant quadrupedal animal? Now, every time I pointed at a quadrupedal animal, I would say cat. But if I point to a human, I would not say cat. Now you're forced to ask the question, what's in common with all of these quadrupedal animals that is not there in a car, not there for a human? The similarity with the word and its correlation forces us to look for another similarity, a, diff a deeper similarity. It's not just that particular thing. It's something about those particular things. So we learn symbols, again, by this interesting relationship between iconic and indexical processes. And we build them up and build them up. And so you know what I'm talking about. If you can generate a similar sort of iconic explanation for the same thing I've done, we know that we've communicated something if we've communicated an icon so that we do the analysis similarly. So what this says is that, that yeah. symbolic communication needs to be built up in a really complicated yeah. way that other species just don't have a predisposition to utilize. So here's another case of this, this, this hierarchy, one, two, three kind of hierarchy that we find in each of these areas. And I think that there's something beneath that, that drives it, um, that me, that's the reason that they're all the same. The, the similarity, like a, correlation, oh, and sorry. what I call displacement, the third one, the symbolic relationship. Um, you repeat, can you mind repeating that again, Terry? Sorry, so, similarity. So basically, Charles Peirce, the philosopher, called this firstness, secondness, and thirdness. I, I've never liked this way of talking. <laughs> but basically, he, he recognizes that, in fact, um, there is some kind of a hierarchy in which the next one up depends upon the one before it. In the mm -hmm. same way that morphodynamics depends upon homeodynamics, and teleodynamics depends upon morphodynamics, which depends upon homeodynamics. Significance depends upon reference, which depends upon the structure and the features of the signed vehicle, Shannon information. Um, symbols depend upon ind indices, which depend upon icons. They have that in common, all of these. And I think that's a deep mystery, uh, maybe even what you might call a metaphysical mystery. I don't think it's magic of any sort, but something about the universe that all these things have in common. This hierarchy dependency. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. I'd love to dive further into that. The uh, some kind of triadic law of a hierarchy that's sort of um, it also. Huh, yeah, that's uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> to well, well, so let me let me give you another example, but, another familiar well, example. Can I just give can I, can I just, yep. uh, one one thing? It's just just because I want to. So because uh, I initially asked about correlation, so homeodynamics reduction of correlation morphodynamics, generation of correlation, would then Telio be... Um, preservation of correlation. Preservation of correlation. Okay, so it's like that 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 tracks across... All. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, continue. Well, so a good example of this relationship is also in, in the standard story about DNA and proteins. 
Um, what we have is the structure of a protein is a three-dimensional complicated system. And its three-dimensionality is its function. Whereas DNA is a sequence, a linear code, so to speak. Um, and yet they're linked to each other. So the linear code providing information uh, that will build a protein. But now think about this relationship. How does it generate it? What's the process? The process is that the sequence of nucleotides in a DNA molecule is copied onto a messenger RNA molecule, which also has a sequence. That sequence um, is, in most cells, goes through kind of a, an editing process, but then gets passed to a ribosome, a very complicated structure made up of RNA and, and protein molecules that takes the sequence of the RNA molecule, of the, excuse me, the messenger RNA molecule, and links it to a transfer RNA molecule, which reads three of the bases. So it turns out that, that DNA works by virtue of each of the three bases in a sequence corresponds to a certain amino acid, one of the building blocks of proteins, and there's 20 of those. Um, so each three, CGT, for example, um, refers to a particular amino acid. Um, there is an iconic relationship between the DNA molecule and the messenger RNA molecule. That is, they stick together literally because the bases match to each other. They're complements to each other. So it becomes a kind of a mirror image. That mirror image of messenger RNA drawn into the ribosome, um, each codon, each of these three nucleotides in the sequence matches to a three-part nucleotide on another RNA molecule called a transfer RNA molecule. So it's an iconic relationship to messenger RNA, an iconic relationship with messenger RNA to a part of what we call the transfer RNA molecule. But at the other end of this transfer RNA molecule, which is folded up into a kind of a branching-like structure, there's an amino acid attached. And so the sequence of iconic mapped AGCs or whatevers um, that make up the codon is passed on iconically, but then the RNA molecule correlates one codon with an amino acid. And therefore, as they line up next to each other, based upon the codon, um, you're lining up amino acids in a particular orientation. But notice that the transfer RNA molecule that's linking the, the three bases to a particular amino acid is, a cor is correlating the two. So what we have is there's an iconic relationship that becomes linked to a, an indexical relationship, a correlational relationship, which allows the organization, the sequence of amino acids to be coded by the sequence on DNA. So here's what we have. We, In a sense, DNA doesn't have this kind of interaction that a protein can. A protein can do all kinds of things. Proteins are the big workhorses of the, of the cell. Yeah. Yeah. But now what's happened is the sequence has, be turn, has been turned into a three-dimensional form because where the sequence of amino acids is located causes the whole thing to fold up in a certain way because some amino acids are attracted to each other. Some amino acids are attracted to water, repel water, are stiff, are flexible. They cause it to fold in a certain way, and it's the structure of the folding that actually is the function of the protein. So as a result, a linear sequence that has none of these features has this step from icon to index to a totally different function, completely displaced, completely unrelated, to the function, in a sense, the, the chemical function of a DNA molecule. There's an iconic link to an indexical link to the protein. Now, what's interesting is that the DNA molecules themselves, because they form this, this, this helix like this twisted helix, the sequence of bases, the sequence of nucleotides um, on a DNA molecule actually affects the twist of the DNA molecule. So different sequence has a slightly different twist. And it turns out that 
some proteins can fit exactly into certain twists. So what happens now is that DNA can be generated by this iconic indexical link to produce a totally different function, unrelated to the original sequence, that can bind to the DNA molecule and turn on or off the expression of other genes. So now we have a kind of recursion. By virtue of having this displacement of function from sequence to three-dimensional structure, that now can bind back on the three-dimensional structure of that sequence, we have a kind of recursive function in which DNA can be transferred into protein, which can affect the expression of DNA. It's by virtue of that loop, that recursive loop of information, that now we have this very complicated process of cells being able to regulate each other's DNA expression. The very possibility of multicelled organisms is the result of this process. So what we have here is that as soon as you have displaced reference, what I would call something similar to symbolic reference, it's not neither iconic nor indexical, but it's produced by this relationship. You now also have the possibility of recursion. And with recursion, you know, the universe is possible. It's incredible. Or at least we are. The, um... Something you just mentioned about the uh, the mapping uh, from a linear uh, set of instructions to say a three D set, um, a three D space. There was a uh, one of my favorite um, one of my favorite page of Incomplete Nature's th page three twenty four, um, <laughs> where you just <laughs> it, it's uh, an incredible. What's that? Uh, oh, I just wrote, wrote down the page know. because. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there's a, a there's a one line in there that stuck out to me because of um, topology is an, an area of interest of mine and for my oh, audience yeah. too. They uh, they are particularly interested in my in my topological uh, or geometric videos. Um, those are my most popular ones for some reason. But there's a line in here from your book that says an emergent dynamical transition is signaled by a change in the topology of the phase space of probable dynamical trajectories. And so, yeah, this linkage here between, say, topology and these iconic indexical symbolic relationships, can you, um, I don't know, a, a speak to that in some way, the, where, where topology starts to come into play here? Well, notice that topology is about iconism and about variations in iconism. That is... Hmm. So degrees of freedom that are similar to each other. So we can talk about, for example, the topology of donuts mm -hmm. being mapped right. to the topology of coffee cups because mm -hmm. of the uh, the handle on the coffee cup. Yeah. They share, they have a similarity, a very high level similarity in terms of the way the, in this case, the surface is structured. And what we're saying here is that a linear topology in the DNA is mapped to a three-dimensional topology in the protein. And that three-dimensional topology can interact with other three-dimensional topologies, such as the twist of the DNA molecule. But the DNA molecule performs its function, so to speak. It's useful in the system because of its linear topology. It's a simple one-dimensional topology. Mm -hmm. so, so what's happening here is a one-dimensional topology is constraining the structure of a three-dimensional topology, which by virtue of the one-dimensional thing, because it's, it's physically embodied as a molecule, it does have also a three-dimensional topology. And therefore, proteins can interact with it. But now you have this strange effect in which topologies at totally different types now become entangled with each other in a complicated way, recursively linked to each other. Um, and we can think of the topology or of the surface or of the uh, sometimes called a phase space. We've described a donut as a, in terms of its surface as a two-dimensional phase space in which there are certain trajectories that can take place there, other 
trajectories can't. Um, but by looking at trajectories that you could follow on the surface of a donut, you realize that the same sort of trajectories can be followed on your surface of your coffee cup. Um, here, what we're saying is that even topologies of a very different dimensionality can become mapped to each other in a way that actually interacts with each other. So that now the phase space that we're talking about in biology is in fact a phase space that involves one dimensional sequences trajectory, creating a three dimensional topology, many more dimensions, which can now modify the expression of this one dimensional topology to produce different combinations of proteins. So what we have here is this, this strange entanglement. What the iconic indexical displacement process allows this kind of complicated buildup. And if we think about language, we realize that language exemplifies this as well. Because I can create a poem with rhyme in which there is a, in a sense, iconicity of sound being used. Mm -hmm. The rhyme itself is not necessarily changing meaning but it does communicate something in addition. The words or sentences nearby each other, correlated with each other. The reason that certain words tend to fit together, correlated together, um, is indexical. They, re they point to each other. So what's happened is by building up language, building up this medium that has, it's a physical medium, it still has degrees of freedom, constraints and shape and structure and so on, we can now use that structure's topology to produce new levels of iconism and indexicality. And of course, uh, we can build up from there. Theories are built up, of course, by many levels of this process. What we've been talking about here, in fact, has this troublesome structure of the, the one, two, three I've talked about here. One, two, three represented in very different circumstances, in very different contexts, and yet has something similar, has a kind of similar topology in each case. Um, it's, it's a hard one to put our fingers on exactly what it is, but I think it's an important secret. What makes <laughs> that's possible? Let's see. So back to morphodynamics, if I may. Um, and you said this, I don't know if you alluded to it here, but I'm certain you said it in a, in a lecture. Um, that you weren't, a, you weren't a fan of the term self-organizing, but you've mentioned self-simplification was uh, a term that someone, someone used, I think, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, what, is, what, would, what would be the preferred term that you would use instead of self-organizing? What would be the best? No, that's why I use more for dynamics. Describe? It's about a dynamics okay. that generates okay. regularity. That's in preference yeah. over that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And, and the reason for um, that's very simple. The, the term, there's no mm -hmm. self. What self really right, refers yeah. to in these cases is there's nothing forcing this to happen. So it happens yes. by itself. But in fact, that's a sort of metaphoric use of the concept of self. Gotcha. It would be like and closer so to I think. I prefer this other term because it's more descriptive of what's actually happening. It's the dynamics that produces form. More, more, gotcha. more thing. Yes. It's like form organizing or thing organizing, not self yeah, exactly. organizing. That, that, that brings uh, a whole other cache of yeah, uh, right. of issues and, and correlations. Okay, got it. So we have so we've worked out the correlations and also a question about the difference between morpho and telio for folks listening to this. Homeodynamics, those are um, uh, at equilibrium. Morphodynamics and telio are far from equilibrium. Are they generally equally as far from equilibrium? Is there uh, some kind of difference in distance? Between those two? Well, so here's the, the key story is that a morphodynamic process will eventually decay into a homeodynamic process. Mm. So, so, okay. so think about the whirlpool. Once the water mm -hmm. is gone, it's gone. Um, think gotcha. about the Bernard convection, the, the development of these hexagonal convection cells in a fluid. Um, once the heat is turned off, it'll go back to just sort of giving off heat in a passive way by conduction. Um, so it decays that way. Mm. Similarly, and this is a little harder to grasp, that teleodynamic systems, when they degrade, they degrade into morphodynamic systems, which destroy 
the order faster than it was produced. So when an organic system dies and decays, the work of preventing, of constraining the chemistry to only be useful chemistry, when that stops, it's already far from equilibrium. There's a lot of processes that will very rapidly decay. Organisms in a warm environment, when they're dead, decay quite rapidly. Now, luckily or unluckily, there are lots of other bugs out there and bacteria and, and creatures that speed up the process, take advantage of the energy that's there um, for their own growth. So there's another feature that is that although morphodynamics is built from the relationship between homeodynamic processes and teleodynamic processes constructed from very specific relationships between morphodynamic processes. When teleodynamic processes break down, they break down initially into morphodynamic processes, which rapidly break down into morph homeodynamic processes. As it goes the other way around, it reverses rapidly. Um, and so one way to think about this is this is all thermodynamics. I want to be clear that I'm not saying this is different than thermodynamics. It's just yes. contorted thermodynamics, you might say. It's, it's combinatorial thermodynamics in which um, you have combinations of specific homeodynamic processes that produce morphodynamic processes. Certain very specific combinations of, of morphodynamic processes that produce teleodynamic processes. But that means that once they're dysregulated and disconnected, um, they go in the opposite direction. They reverse. Uh, much like I asked to, to, continue oh, our, to continue our example from, from semiotics, from icon index and symbol, um, if you don't understand, you're another country, somebody is using words that you don't understand, you don't have the same interpretive capacity, um, we typically fall back on indices, pointings, and pantomime, iconism. It degrades in the same way. And then we can build up yeah. our meaning to understand this other language because with the pantomime and the pointing and the so on, eventually we get it. Ah, now I see what that means. Or at least yeah. I have a, a rough idea of what it means. I mean, I may need lots of different examples to sort of build this up. So in a sense, because of the hierarchic nature of this, it the reverse is also possible. Mm. That's interesting. That's what what a link there. Um, I have to wrap my head around. I have very little knowledge of semiotics, to be honest. <laughs> so I have to uh, go and maybe uh, take a course or something. Well, and, the, the problem with semiotics is with it's it. now almost entirely been um, used to talk about processes in the humanities. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. It has not made it into science, which is sad as far as you know, I, I began really in the beginning of the 1980s thinking that this was going to revolutionary revolutionize our thinking about how brains work, how bodies work, mm -hmm. how evolution works, how language works. Um, it's now been, you know, 40 years and it hasn't made it into science. Semiotic theory is mostly for the arts. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a travesty of science that it has not, that people haven't figured out that this three-step hierarchic relationship is an absolutely crucial way to think about information, an absolutely well, crucial way to think us... about communication, and even mental processes. I think there should be a semiotic cognitive science. In fact, I've written a couple of pieces about this. What, is, what would mm. a semiotic cognitive science, a semiotic analysis of brain function look like? Yeah. Because brains are about producing reference and meaning and significance. Right. Can you give us a sense of why I have no context at all as to why, why, did, why didn't it take off? Any theories? I think it's <laughs> partly because we've, we've made a mistake in the term symbol. Let me see if I can explain this. We've simplified the concept or made it more ambiguous. When you look at your screen on the computer and you see an alphanumeric character, you call it a symbol. Mm -hmm. um, by itself, it, it's correlated with a sound. And it looks like other symbols of its kind. It's an alphanumeric character. It, if it's in part of a word, it's now that 
that configuration refers to something because of the way you've learned to interpret it. But now looking at my computer screen, suddenly I see a bunch of random alphanumeric characters just showing up all over the place, supposedly at random. Um, they don't symbolize anything now. In fact, they indicate that something is wrong with my computer, that this process becomes an index. The way it's interpreted determines whether it's a symbol or not. But we've used the term ambiguously to refer to a kind of reference relationship and a kind of conventional token. And if we use it for both, we confuse the two. This really traces back to the 19th century with symbolic logic. The idea that we can now talk about alphanumeric characters as symbols without talking about the referential process, how they refer, um, allows us to do what Claude Shannon did, which is to say, I'm going to ignore that and just look at the properties of these signed vehicles, of these media, and ignore the referential features. Well, one of the problems I had with my 90s book, The Symbolic Species, was that people looked at it and said, well, the symbols, oh, yeah, everybody knows what symbols are. Cats can learn symbols. Dogs can learn symbols. Uh, a rat in a Skinner box can respond to a light going off to know that it's time to get a drink. Um, isn't that a symbol of drink time? No, it's an index. But if, if you've collapsed all forms of communication into something like arbitrary language, arbitrary codes, and you don't realize that arbitrary codes need to be constructed for iconic and indexical communications, that you can't, they just don't come given. They got to be constructed. And that construction requires other forms of communication that are not symbolic. Um, if you don't realize that, and you just ignore that part, you've effectively pulled up the ladder that's produced all this. So no wonder we have trouble understanding how language has evolved, because we treat it as though it's just a correlation relationship. A sound is correlated with something in the world. Um, no wonder we're confused about um, the origins of molecular information, because we don't recognize the complexity of how you build up these kinds of relationships. These things are not just given. But I think in linguistics, what's happened is that for the most part, we think about language, we're trying to figure out the structure of language, how language works in different languages. We look at whole sentences and we analyze how they must be put together, even though um, that's certainly not how I'm producing these sentences. I don't have a list of words and I'm figuring out how they fit together. In fact, I'm starting out with a fairly undifferentiated icon. An idea I want to get across is somewhat incoherent. And I'm progressively differentiating it into these things we call words and sentences. But neurologically, they don't start out as words and sentences. They start, start, start out as iconic and indexical relationships. And I quickly build them up because of this wonderful, wonderful facility that we human beings have into these sentences. But the sentences are at the end of the line. They don't begin the process. Yeah, one thing I was wondering about and uh, this is probably going to uh, give away my lack of knowledge in this area, but I'll try here, is uh, telio, with teleodynamics, that's the beginning of uh, semiosis, right? Um, but I couldn't understand why, why isn't that a level earlier? So two homeodynamic um, uh, forces coming together uh, create a morphodynamic uh, system, let's say. Uh, to that morphodynamic dynamic system, why are those two homeodynamic um, things coming together? How are those not symbols? Well, we could we could that, give them symbols, yeah. of course. I could, you know, I could. Yeah, but to the system, but to the morphodynamic with A's and B's and X's and Y's, um, right, right, I could right. do that. But the question is, um, for something to be interpreted to be about something else, something that they are not something elsewhere in the world, potentially maybe not even existent. And this is why I began the book Symbolic Species talking about absence. Because what we're really talking about are things, words are things that are built around what they're not. Mm -hmm. They function by virtue of their correlation with something and their similarity to something that they're not. Their re reference, their meaning, their value. Um, 
And in that respect, if you're in a science that is unable to deal easily with representation relationships, in which things must be physically linked to each other, then in effect, you're unable to sort of think in these terms. So part of the reason I, I call the book Incomplete Nature, and why I began with a chapter on absence, um, is because I think that's the most important thing that's been absent from our science. A way to deal with formally how ab what I call absential relationships actually are critical to things like life. But the story with a, with a sign vehicle is that anything can be a sign of anything else in any possible way, so long as you have an interpretive mechanism that establishes that link with something and something that's, that it's not. So things are not intrinsically signs of anything else. So what I should say is the dirt on the, my window is not intrinsically a sign of anything. But if I know that trucks have been driving by through the mud and splashing, it can now be a sign of something that happened in the past of a specific type. But it wouldn't be that for a fly. It wouldn't be that for my cat. It would be that for me. Because I have this interpretive capacity built up from icons and indices. What are they, what's the iconics? Watch many cars driving by and splashing. And I've seen that there's a correlation between that and the, the presence of dirt. Um, I can use that information, that past information, to see the dirt on my, win my window as referring to what's out there. And maybe even I could use it as a normative feature to say, no, look, I, I want to talk to the county and tell them they have to drive their trucks slower as they go by my house. Um, there's, it can have a function, but in and of itself, it's just an, what, what Gibson would call an affordance. It can be used because it's got these iconic and indexical relationships with something else in the world. It can be used, but only if the appropriate interpretive process is applied. So this is the way of thinking about Shannon. Shannon is thinking about the intrinsic features. Nothing is intrinsically a sign of anything else in any other way. But things can be signs of something else by virtue of a capacity to interpret. And in fact, this is the power of the sciences. We've learned to interpret all these iconic and indexical features of the world to be about things, about functions, about what happened historically, and so on and so forth. Um, we're building up this confidence. We're building up an interpretive confidence. It's interesting. I want to... This is, might seem far afield, but um, it's a, somewhat of a metaphysical question. I wasn't sure we'd get here, but we're, we're, I think we're kind of getting into the space around uh, from Gregory Bateson's book, um, Steps to an Ecology of Mind, uh, which maybe you're familiar with. It was a major with. influence um, of mine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I can tell there's a lot of overlap here. But um, he had this quote from it or a short passage about the map territory relationship. And it's something that is stuck with me and I still can't seem to shake it off in terms of it's like always kind of bugging me in my head. And he talks about um, a man who goes out to like a field with a measuring stick and he talks about, he goes out and he, he lays out um, and measures what's out there, goes home and writes on a piece of paper. Um, he draws what's what he measured out in the field. And what you start to realize is that all you get is, sort of maps of maps of maps, the, uh, the retinal representation of the man who made the, who made the map. It's, um, there's a mapping in the, in the man's brain. It, it just keeps going back and back where you're not sure where does the territory even come in, if ever, um, because you're, there's always the, this process of, of doing the representation. Um, do you have any comments about that or is that? Uh, yes, because I think well? it's one of the areas where I think, um, Philosophers have gotten off track and, and trapped, going all the way back hmm. to Bishop Barclay. Um, the, remember, what you just described is a great way to describe it, because the thing you've just done on paper is physical. And now I can make a map of that map 
but it's going to be on something physical. So what's going on in my brain when I look at that map is some of the correlations, some of the iconism of the space was carried over to the physical map, was carried over to the neurological activity. But notice that because it's physical at every step, I can also now go out into that space and modify it. Why? Because the correspondence, the constraints that have been passed, I've just taken one constraint from the physical space. It's topological, topographic relationship. And I've mapped that, but embodied it in something physical. Because it was embodied in something physical, which is embodied in the physical activity of my nervous system, which will affect the physical activity of my body, I can actually modify the original hall of mirrors that just goes back to maps and maps and maps. The whole key to life is that each of these maps are linked to each other and to the real world. So the idea that to some extent it's just a map is oversimplifying. It's ignoring the fact that because it has a physical shape, a physical set of relationships, it can also interact with the physical world. But in fact, if I've screwed up the map in some way, and I then go back out into the physical world, I can actually get an index that I made a mistake. I walk this far, and where I was supposed to find a hole, I don't find it, even though my map showed it did. Because they each have a physical embodiment, I can get an index that says, I got to go back and change that map. That loop of causality. It never leaves the loop of causality. It never leaves the physical world. But constraints can be passed from substrate to substrate. The whole key to communication is that a constraint or form, if you want to think about it in those terms, can be passed from one substrate to another to another. My favorite example of this is actually reading a journal article where they've laid out the A's, G's, C's, and T's of a chunk of DNA, and I go back to the lab, and I type that into my machine and produce that particular gene that was discovered by somebody else 10 years before, and I insert it into my experimental organism, and it produces a protein that has a particular function. That gene, the information on that gene, the, the, the sequence of nucleotides, now became a sequence of A's, G's, and C's, and T's which then became a sequence of keystrokes as I typed it into the, the machine, which then produced a, a chunk of DNA of the same kind. I then used my CRISPR technique to in, insert it into the genome of some other organism, and I've now taken the information that was embodied in one substrate, turned into a, a typographical substrate, turned into a mechanical process to produce a particular chemistry, chemical, the information has been maintained because it was capable of being moved. The constraints were capable of being maintained iconically from medium to medium to medium. Again, that's similar to what I was just describing in terms of the recurs recursive relationship between DNA and proteins and the twist of DNA molecules. It's physical all the way. But what we've done is that we have, in a sense, fallen into a kind of Cartesian error in thinking that information is disembodied in some way. It's not a physical thing, but information is always embodied. Mm -hmm. It's always a constraint of some physical something, even just right. energy. And it's notice that this is, this is this, not just Descartes, it goes all the way back to Plato, that you can have ideal forms mm -hmm. that are separate from the physical world somehow. The... Um... You touched on this before too, but that's something I did want to ask you about the, perhaps I can't remember if you had said this or, um, that was Robert Fano who, who said something about not liking the term information theory. Yes. Right. Um, about and 15, Shannon 20 years either. later, he, he was interviewed. Yeah. 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 He says, I, I don't like it sense. because information is, is not about information. It's about the signal, the structure of the signal and the features right. of the signal. Yeah. Because it's information is always rather than, about something. Yeah. But this is the difference between the technical term and the colloquial term. 
The problem is sure. the colloquial term captures something important, and we need to figure out how to put that something important back into our science. Hmm. The aboutness. Would there be a term? Would there be a? Yeah, I guess aboutness would be, but that's yeah. You know, have to it's say it's so it's trivial. Or not I think it's so trivial, it. and yet um, <laughs> explain how something can be about something else is not trivial. We take it for granted with respect to our mm. nervous systems and our thinking processes. Um, we sort of gloss of, gloss over it and take it take take it for granted in thinking about DNA and life, without really knowing what we're talking about. Um, mm. But it's this aboutness relationship that's critical. The with regards to teleodynamics. Is there, and this is you know uh, p- potentially speculative, let's say, but can you foresee a level beyond teleodynamics? Like, is there a level four? Is there a way if you have so. two teleodynamic processes? No. Okay. Why? What I would say is that teleodynamic processes can be iconic of each other. That teleodynamic mm-hmm. processes in the world, like living systems, can use up the energy and break down the environment. Different organisms can interact with each other in a way that amplifies things. So Darwin's theory of sexual selection is one in which two tendencies of two organisms, two teleodynamic systems, uh, in a sense, drive each other. The peacock's tail um, is more elaborate because females choose those tails, um, and then they give rise to babies that have that tendency to both produce those tails because of the genes from the father and females that have a tendency to like those tails. But here's the key, the key story there is that this is also a way that females get good males, get good genes. Why? Because if you're a male peacock strutting around with big tails that make it hard to fly and making a lot of weird noises, you're likely to get picked off by predators. But if you can do this and not get picked off by predators, you got to have some pretty good genes. So a female that chooses that guy is going to pass those good genes on. But that's a kind of morphodynamic process among teleodynamic processes. So this, I like to describe this as one, two, three, repeat. You go through the same cycle again in hierarchy, just like we were talking about with language, as you can have rhyme in language, you can have meaning rhyme in language, where things have to carry the same meaning but in a slightly different way in, in your story. You have that, that kind of iconism. Or you can have, um, you know, the reason that you've put words together in a certain way, they can point to each other in, in interesting ways. Indexical relationships. Um, so once you've built up to the third level, the, whether it's teleodynamics or symbols, um, the whole process can start again because you've got new sign vehicles. You've got new dynamics, new units of operation that you can work on. So this is why I like to describe it as one, two, three, repeat. Repeat, It's not that there's not a fourth level. It's just that you can build this up. Some people have called this scaffolding. Build up a scaffold on top of a scaffold on top of a scaffold to get higher and higher, to build more complex systems. Gotcha. Okay, now I have a few very specific questions between homeo, morpho, and telio. And you answered one of them before about the correlation uh, generation versus pre- preservation. And now I just like a few, we could just run through them. Uh, homeodynamics tend towards loss of symmetries, right? Yeah. Is that correct? I think that's right. Yes. Good. Yeah. And- Sorry, for sure. Yep. So if they, if homeo tends to a loss of symmetry, uh, okay. symmetries, what about for morpho and telio with respect to the same? So, so, so morpho generates new symmetries, new constraints. Okay. It's always kind it's of morphed. this way. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And Telio um, depends upon generating preserves. constraints, but then preserving them. Gotcha. So that's probably the case for all of these, probably all these questions. Well, we talked about equilibrium. Morphodynamics are metastable. Are teleodynamics yeah, right. also metastable? Or does that change? Or is it a different, no. is it a different kind so, of so metastability? It determines what you mean by metastable. Sometimes it's used to say that they're they're extra stable, whereas mor- mm. morphodynamic processes are quite unstable. In fact, um, they're runaway processes. They go faster and faster and faster, eliminating the very processes that generate them. Mm. Okay. So they're unstable. So if, to some extent, you have a process. Equilibrium is incredibly stable. 
You have to do work to push something away from equilibrium. But you also have to do work to push something so far away from equilibrium that it becomes self-simplifying. That becomes morphodynamic. It takes work to generate morphodynamics. It takes work to generate forms because the second law of thermodynamics, this ubiquitous effect, is always allowing forms to break down. Loss of constraint, loss of symmetries. So, so one is. of the ways that this, this becomes hmm. problematic uh, in, yeah. in general systems theory and complexity theory is we often talk about symmetry breaking as being important. Mm -hmm. um, to some extent, symmetry breaking means, in a sense, things are not equilibrium. You're adding there's somehow a new constraint here. Symmetry breaking processes um, are common, but the problem is that when you break symmetries, um, oftentimes they just generate new morphodynamic processes and new homeodynamic processes. When you eliminate symmetries, um, things don't become regular anymore. But oftentimes if they're dynamical, if there's, a, if there's constant energy input into a system, it will fall into a new symmetry. So there's, there's potentially many stable symmetries in morphodynamic processes. Again, a great example of this is snow crystals. Snow crystals are a kind of memory of the temperature and humidity gradients that they've fallen through. So that early on towards the center of the snow crystal, the temperature and humidity will cause certain kinds of crystalline growth, sheets maybe. Um, as it falls through a different area of temperature and humidity, the crystal formation may turn into spires, and it falls through another area, it may turn into um, plates of various kind. So we get that the snow crystal, the, the completed snow crystal, is in effect a history of its past. It's been frozen, stopped from degrading. Um, what's happened is that in each case there's been a symmetry break. As it changes from one kind of crystal formation to another, that's a break in symmetry. That break in symmetry is because of a difference, a change in the boundary conditions that are driving it, in this case, determined by temperature, pressure, and humidity. Gotcha. So a snow crystal is sort of a history of all the symmetry breaking. Right. The, um, hmm. Yeah, it's like locked in the the memory over time, yeah, yeah because, into well, a stable it, form. Yeah, It's become yeah. preserved because it's cold. We don't have that option. Hmm. Hmm. Sure, sure. Except sure. in our bones. Yeah. I ask, yeah, if we uh, also take a step uh, uh, looking at this from above a bit, what has been the scientific community's response to um, incomplete nature and also like these three types of uh, dynamics that you've laid out? Um, can, you, can you share what, what the response has been like? Both directions, of course, as is typically the case. Mm. Um, there have been a number of people who go, oh, right, of course. Then there's the classic, oh, yeah, we knew that. Um, or, you know, this is crazy, you know, and yeah. where's the math? Get this straight. There's there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that philosophers have been all over the map, philosophers of science. Some accept it, some, you know, because they're interested in different questions to some extent. Um, and in one sense, Incomplete Nature is a book that is sort of this troublesome mix between science and philosophy. And so the scientists look at this and they say, oh, that's philosophy, let's ignore it. And the, the scientists and the philosophers look at it and say, well, that's science, it's not relevant to what we're talking about. Um, it's one way to ignore what it says. Um, the problem, of course, is it's a big book. I, I wrote too long a book. Um, and it's difficult for people to get all the way through it. Um, and that's a real challenge. I, I realize that I've been, my publisher said, we're never going to publish something that long again from you. Don't give us one. So I, I'm trying not to do that again. But but gotcha. in any case, it's been mixed. Um, okay. I would say that the one area that I think is eventually, irrespective of whether people ignore it or take it into account, eventually we're going to discover autogenic viruses. The, the model system that I talked about is based upon known empirical chemical processes that we've studied and we understand pretty well. And there's no magic. There's nothing up my sleeve in this story. I haven't assumed anything. 
So in effect, uh, this is maybe a thought experiment at this point in time, but it's an empirically testable thought experiment. It might even be produced in the lab. Somebody might do it in the lab. Uh, I've actually tried to get people to do it, but, but of course, most people who have a, a lab capable of doing this are already committed to doing lots of other work. And are they going to jump towards this? Um, I've been talking to a couple of people about just looking for autogenic viruses. How do you look for autogenic viruses? Can you look for them in the outer frozen planets of our solar system where there's no liquid water but liquid methane? Um, can you have something made up of hydrogen cyanide polymers instead of proteins? Um, or will you find these as fossils on Mars? Um, I think that there's much, many more possible ways to do autogenic virus-like processes than life. Life is incredibly dependent on very precise conditions. And so, you know, we just get all the right ones here on Earth. Um, I think that, in fact, the raw materials um, that ultimately become proteins, I think, came in on comets from the outer solar system. And I do think they were hydrogen cyanide polymers. Um, hmm. It's a whole other story about, you might say, solar genesis of life, uh, in which only when these molecules come into rocky planets that can have liquid water on them, uh, do we now have ways that these molecules can be modified in a rapid way that can produce something like life. But it doesn't, wouldn't surprise me if something like these autogenic viruses, remember, they're not metabolizing. Um, they're just self self-repairing, self-reproducing. And very, very slow, they could be, you know, reproducing at, a, you know, a thousand years at a shot. You know, one, every thousand years, one turns over. Um, that could still exist out there on Titan or something like that, or in the uh, the, the, the liquid water underneath um, Ganymede around Jupiter or something like that. You know, there's, I think there's lots of possibilities for finding, finding these. As soon as we do, we will lose that special sense of life having to be like Earth life. This is not exactly life, but it's the transition. I call it teleodynamics because it's more than just life. All life is teleodynamic. But that doesn't mean that there can't be other kinds of teleodynamics. So it's not the origins of life that I'm interested in. It's the origins of teleodynamics, or another way to put it, it's the origins of normative chemistry. That's the boundary that I think is interesting. Gotcha. That's very interesting. Um, could you discuss, are you familiar at all with um, uh, Carl Friston's free energy principle? Yes, I am. Familiar about that? Like, how does that fall in, or does it, how, how would that be folded into um, this kind of model? What's interesting about his model, free, the free energy, it's not actually about energy per se. It's using right. uh, this analogy to throw an dynamic free mm -hmm. energy, gives free energy to talk about cognitive processes and how brains function. Um, mm -hmm. In one sense, I think it's exactly right. In the sense that Shannon is a necessary story, that thermodynamic processes are a necessary story. The reduction of free energy is falling to equilibrium, a stable state. But there is no analog to morphodynamics in that story and no analog to teleodynamics. Teleodynamics is the creation of a self. Something that can be a beneficiary, is organized by information, and can pass on information. Um, yes, I think that there, there's going to be a homeodynamic-like logic to neurological processes. But I also think that this ignores the fact that there can be also morphodynamic processes, regularities of dynamics in the brain. They get generated and become more and more regular. In fact, I think it's those regularities that are the units of information, not the, the spiking of a neuron here or there. I think it's the dynamics of populations that fall into morphodynamic relationships. And the way that there is a self perspective in nervous systems is when multiple morphodynamic relationships in different parts of the nervous system get coupled in a teleodynamic way, so that they each support each other. That, I think, produces a point of perspective to be about something else. So I, I see Friston's story as exactly on target 
but not developing up to the level of the self. There is no self. It's just assumed to be a self there that receives and interprets these signals. Mm. I think it's the teleodynamics of brains that do this. And the teleodynamics is just a dynamics. It's a dynamics in which morphodynamic, regularized processes in the nervous system get coupled in a way that they maintain each other and reproduce each other. Our experience of self maintains itself, reconstitutes itself every time we wake up. You have to have some point of reference to have aboutness. And I think that only happens teleodynamically. So I do think there is a teleodynamic story to be told about the nervous system. But that's not just going to involve signals. It's not going to be computation in the simple sense. Because it's going to involve energy. Not even in the abstract, like Friston's free energy principle. Actual energy, blood flow, oxygen, glucose. I think, I think they play a role in this process because you need that to drive processes to become morphodynamic. You need to have a change in the flow of energy through the system. That's what morphodynamics is about. You're pushing things away from equilibrium, away from their lowest free energy state. So what I would say to Carl, it's not, yeah, you're right, but there's a whole lot more to it. And you can't just rely on the system having a tendency to go to equilibrium to be doing reference. There's no reference there. It's just going to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. For reference, for aboutness, a relationship between the signal structure and what it refers to, you have to have this, this kind of a structure. So I think that in the end, I think this is, a, this is, in a sense, where I began in this process and ended up writing a prequel to, to Symbolic Species, is that I realized that we had to have a story about the dynamics of nervous systems that was very different than computing, mm. that, had, that was a dynamical process that created self as a referential center, that generated a system that, in a sense, could repair itself, could reorganize itself, could restabilize itself far from equilibrium. Not a reduction in free energy, just the opposite. Yeah. But stabilize <laughs> free energy. And I, I want to return back to, um, you didn't mention the book specifically, but the top of, the, of our call, you, you mentioned uh, Girls and Completeness Theorem and uh, a book that I'm, I'm assuming you've read, uh, Hofstadter's Girl Escher Bach. Oh, yes. Um, are, are you familiar with it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'd imagine. I mean, you've referenced Strange Loops before. Um, and could you speak about that book at all? And maybe its influence uh, on you and uh, anything from it that well, the, maybe... The, the problem with it, of course, it, it, is it, it, he, deals, he deals with Strange Loops um, in information alone. And I think the key to this and why his book is relevant or the, the idea of a strange loop is relevant um, is that it's always material. The strange loop of an organism is that its information is the result of its physicality and the physical causality that it organizes. And that physical causality is what produces the information. There's a strange loop between what philosophers would call um, epistemology and ontology. Epistemology, the, the, in a sense, the problem of, of aboutness, of meaning, of mind. Uh, mm -hmm. and of reference. In ontology, what exists in the physical world? What we're finding here is that you know, it, information is not some separate disembodied stuff, and then there's stuff. No, the stuff has affordances that are informational. If you have a system organized in the right way to take that information, informing the stuff to produce the information, that's a strange loop, but it's a strange loop of epistemology to ontology to epistemology. So the strange loop that Hofstetter is about, which comes from Gödel, of course, has to do with this idea that, in fact, self-reference sneaks into Gödel's proof. In fact, the history of this, which goes back um, to the beginning of the 20th century with, with Russell and Frege, um, is that Russell points out that there's a weird paradox uh, in logical set theory. And that is 
the or, or what was called class member theory. Um, that what he pointed out is that yes, you can sort of describe logic in terms of symbols that refer to sets of things, types of things. Um, and you can have, therefore, a symbol can refer to a whole set of things. So the term cat can refer to a class of organisms. But he pointed out that there's a problem with set theory, and that is that at its base, it is self-destructive. And since this is sort of like the morphodynamic problem we were talking about. Mm -hmm. He said, the problem is this, that you can have a class of all the classes that are members of themselves. So the class of concepts is a concept. So the class of all classes, or the class of all concepts, is a concept, it's a member of itself. But he said, but you can't have a class of all classes that are not members of themselves. Because that's self-contradictory. Because if it's not a member of itself, it has to be a member of that class. But if it's a member of that class, then it can't be a member of itself. It's a variant of the liar's paradox. This statement mm -hmm. is false. Because if it's false, then it's true that it's false. But if it's true that it's false, then it's false that it's true that it's false. The problem with that mm -hmm. statement is you can't stop interpreting it. Because every time you interpret it, you have to do it again. Mm -hmm. this, this produces a loop. And this is why it's a strange loop, because it keeps undermining itself. Now, there's an example of this in mathematics that we're all reasonably familiar with if you've had any kind of middle-level mathematics, and that is so-called so complex numbers or imaginary numbers. So the imaginary number is um, that times itself that's equal to minus 1. Um, so i times i equals negative 1, um, or i squared is negative 1. So the square root of negative 1 is i. Well, the problem with this is that it's the same thing as the liar's paradox. And the way you can do this is think about i times i equals negative 1. I can cancel i on one side by dividing negative 1 by i. So i equals negative 1 over i. But I've just shown that i is the same as negative 1 over i. So now I can replace that i with negative 1 over i. So now it's negative 1 over negative 1 over i. And I can do that forever. What's happening is that negative 1 over negative 1 over i is a minus times a minus is a plus. But I do it again, and it's a minus. So i is something that oscillates between 1 and minus 1. And it can't stop oscillating because you can't stop interpreting it. Unless, in mathematics, you say, I'm not going to continue to do this. I'm just going to call it i. And leave it at that. But it turns out that that's a very useful trick. In fact, it's useful because it actually can produce, with just numbers, two dimensions. Because i times 0 is 0. And that means that now I can have a, what we call now complex numbers, where we can have a real component and an imaginary component, where we have an i in the equation. It says it's an imaginary component because i is the unit in this other dimension. But there's a problem with this. And that is, um, what's the square root of negative i? The same problem shows up. Well, OK, let's solve this. We'll call that j, i and j. Now we have three dimensions. There's the j dimension, and the i dimension, and the real number dimension. And they all cross at value 0. So now, within a number system, if I have equations that are that have to be resolved by solving them with j, it, it can be a three-dimensional system, very complicated. But but then, of course, there's a troubling problem. What's the square root of negative j? In fact, well, let's call that k. What's the square root of negative k? Well, let's call that l. Can I stop? No. What this says is that using imaginary numbers, it's it's something that is necessary to solve certain kinds of equations. But it shows us that the number system is open to unstoppable interpretation. You can't stop calculating. You can only say, I'm going to 
I'm going to conventionally stop by giving it a name. Recognizing that it could go on forever. But I'm not going to do that. So now we have this, this interesting problem that the sort of incompleteness story is built into mathematics. It's built into logic. I think it's built into the cosmos. And here's the way to think about it. Negative numbers are absences. So if you've got a theory that requires that you can do things with absences, representations, constraints, things that are prevented from happening, then you've got the same problem. I think that the universe is a strange loop in this sense. That is, it, you can't stop dimensionality. That it's now every calculation, every operation you do might take you back one or two of these steps, but there's an indefinite number of steps. And the key here is Gödel's result in one way or another. What he did is he found out that that you can do the same thing um, by recoding. And interestingly enough, remember I talked about the DNA protein relationship, where you've where you've got what amounts to a displaced relationship where the sequence now is linked to a three-dimensional structure. Mm -hmm. Gödel's argument was to figure out how you can recode one thing into another. And he used the prime numbers as his model. Take a particular expression, mathematical expression, and give it a prime number name. The number now stands for that expression. Because you have an infinite number of prime numbers, you don't have to follow it out. You can know that any expression can be recoded. But that means now you can have an expression about expressions. It's the same problem. And so it turns out that Gödel can prove that, that mathematics and logic are either consistent, or you can't have 1 equal 5 by any operation, or it's incomplete. But you can't have something that's both consistent and complete. That's the incompleteness theorem. What I'm make, my claim here is that that's the nature of the cosmos. I actually think it's the nature of time. But that's a long, deep story. Um, by, by virtue of this, I think that, that three dimensions, i, j, and k, yeah. um, give you space. They give you relationships in which things are definitely related to each other, but you don't have absences. Things don't become present and absent. But once you have the possibility of presence and absence, you have negative relationships. I think time is indefinite dimensionality. Each operation we engage in, I think it can be calculated sometimes into a single dimension, single extra dimension. But I think in the long run, time is open like this. It's open in a much more radical sense. It's not like Einstein thought that it's a single dimension, a fourth dimension. It's just that in three dimensions, you can produce any number of stable relationships. Think about a, a diagram in which you've got a, a three-pointed star. Link the tips of two three-pointed stars, and you have two ends that are free. Link, the, link those two to another one, and you have um, six or five ends that are free. Any number of relations, I think, can be calculated by three dimensions, but not change. So I think change is all the rest of the dimensionality. But it's precisely because dimensionality is incomplete that you can have emergence, that you can have novelty. If it was complete, if there was only a fourth dimension, and we were living in a four-dimensional block, then everything has happened already. The problem is, even in that model, I mean, Einstein used the example oftentimes in, in textbooks do this. Imagine space is a two-dimensional sheet, mm -hmm. and you have a bunch of them stacked on top of each other. And um, you're at one point, and you're moving to another point. So over time, as you look through this stack, you move from one point to another in space. Um, so now you have a three-dimensional block, 
and time is this wandering through this block, this line that goes through the block. Mm -hmm. The question is, why are you not at every when? Why are you in one point in one space, another point in another one, another one, another one? Why is there? Why are you not every when? Okay, well, maybe I can solve this by saying, you know, going from point to point to point, I'm actually using time. I'm claiming that that's time, but to figure out why I'm not in every point at the same time, why I'm not absent sometimes and present and other times in space, I need to have time. So in order to solve this three-dimensional block where you've got time in it, now I need a four-dimensional block. Okay, now time is the fourth dimension, but the same problem reappears. Why am I not every when? Why is there now? And the answer is, okay, I can add a fifth dimension and use that to talk about time, why not in every when. But you can't stop that process. So I think another way to think about this in very abstract terms is to take Gödel literally about the cosmos. Consistency means no miracles. Incompleteness means that, that it can never be complete. There's always something possible that's different. We live in a universe that has no miracles. But because it has no miracles, it has to be incomplete, fundamentally at its base. So this is going way out there. I'm sorry, but you know. No, I love it. It's great. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Huh. I keep you up at night. <laughs> yeah, it might. <laughs> Think about it too long. I'm My goodness. Huh. Yeah, you. I, I can't remember if it was something you'd written or someone written something about yours, but since we're kind of wading into these waters anyway, the um, the link between um, absence, absential qualities, and uh, yin and yang, yin and yang, um, oh, I'm not yeah. sure if it's in the book okay. or if you had talked about it or someone else had written about it, but so, do you have anything, so, so do you have I any comment on the Taoist like Korea? Linking the two together. Uh, and yeah. also, um, um, I've used this relationship, first of all, in the in chapter one, which is actually the second chapter of Incomplete Nature. Um, mm -hmm. I begin it with an epigraph from the Tao Te Ching. Mm. Because what I want help to give people a sense of is why we need to think about absence. And I can roughly remember what that little couplet was about. It says, you know, 30 spokes converge to the wheel's hub, but it's the empty space at that hub that allows the wheel to function. We can carve, um, actually I say, we can form clay into a vessel, but it's not the vessel from which we get use as much as the space that it bounds. We cut doors and windows into walls so that we can make use of the space that are, that's protected by those walls. He ends by saying, we gain from what is there to use what is not there. So in that respect, I think there's a deep Taoist relationship here. It's what's absent. It's the space that's created that use comes from. But notice that we're talking about use. That's what life is about. That's what information is about. It's about use. Is it good for something? Does it have value? Um, and so I think that Lao Tzu, who, who supposedly is the guy who comes up with this centuries ago, um, had a sense of, of how the absence works. And of course, this is the yin of yin and yang. Yang is the stuff that's there, and the yin is what's not there. It's the space that's made possible by what is there, the use, the affordance that's made possible. Mm. So what's, what's troubling about all of this is there's something similar in all of these, and, <laughs> and I see it, but I don't quite grasp exactly what it is. Well, that's part of the fun of it, right? That's why I do it. This, yeah. uh, it's part of the mystery. So, the good yeah, news so is, symbolic speed, yeah. The good news Actually, is that you know, I no longer have to publish or perish. Oh, yes. Now, once, once yeah, you can you can fool around. You can be crazy. Mm. Yeah, you're in the fun part of it. Couldn't do this when I was younger. 
Right. Yes. That's what I, I've heard that from a number of scientists actually also. So <laughs> yes, that's, uh, so, so your book, Symbolic Species came out in 1997, right? Complete Nature came out in 2011. So yeah, if the pattern continues, yeah, so, so the one, pattern continues, going to come out hopefully next year, but it's not done yet. Wow. So it's every 14 years for you. You just, uh, book so. after book. <laughs> that's an interesting Bad cycle. News, to be it, does, on. it doesn't bode well for my fourth book. <laughs> I got to live a well, long time. You never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, stave off the thermodynamic process exactly. <laughs> for a little longer. Stay a little oh, teleodynamic for a while. Great. Yeah, right. I know you have to go in a moment. I do want to ask you one last question, and this is just aside from the, the science stuff, but um, I ask this to everybody that comes on. Um, if you could give your 20-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? I suppose be less selfish. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's a good piece. If you want to elaborate, that's fine. But if you just want to leave it at that, that's cool too. <laughs> no, I, you know, when we're young, we think we're going to live forever, and mm. we really want to. You know, we really want to make our difference in the world. Um, mm. We want to be famous. We want to have the you know the best mates or whatever. Um, but in fact, that gets in the way. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. I, that's a good piece of advice. I appreciate it so much, Terry. This was a wonderful conversation. I can't wait for uh, to hear what the audience has to say about it. Please, people, if you're if you're watching now, uh, comment below um, with with your thoughts. I just want to thank you so much for all of your time. This has been such a pleasure. This is amazing. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Thank you.